Hi, this is Dr. Dix Winston, and you're in this week's edition of In the Study. The reason we do these videos is each week we want to um, pique your interest in the passage that we're speaking on Sunday morning. Not only that, but we want to um, prep you for that passage that you might pre-study it so um, you'll know a little bit more about it, and um, I think it'll be a little bit more meaningful if you've kind of pre-studied the passage. It's not brand new to you. We'll kind of tell you where we're flowing and where we're going to go, and that's what I'll do today. But the third reason is that by listening to these short snippets, we hope that we will prod you to watch us as we stream on Sunday mornings. So the three Ps of In the Study are to pique your interest, to prep you for the message, the truth, and then finally to prod you to listen to that as we come together streaming again this Sunday on crosspointco.org. Again, you can go to our page, our website, at about uh, 9.55, and you'll see a button there that if you press that, you'll go live with us. And we'll begin with worship, and uh, then we'll get into this message that we're doing. Now, this Sunday is Mother's Day. The good news and bad news is that um, it's Mother's Day, good news. The bad news is that we're not here at church to celebrate all those wonderful mothers that we have at Crosspoint, both those that have been mothers for many, many years and some of those that are brand new mothers. In fact, uh, Eunice, our uh, director of children's ministry, is probably our newest mother here at Crosspoint. And we always like to recognize those mothers. So Eunice, we recognize you as the newest. I know it's your third child, but still, you're a mother all over again. When I think of Mother's Day, I'm reminded of one of my favorite Irma Bombeck columns. In speaking of mothers and the creation of mothers, she said this, she said a note, an angel noticed that God had been working a long time on one particular top secret project. And an angel said to him, uh, Lord, you're sure spending a lot of time on this project and no one knows what you're doing. Could you give me a little insight? And um, he said, well, the Lord turned and said to him, have you read the specs on this model? He says, no, it's a top secret. He says, tell me a little about, about, about it, and here's what God says. She's supposed to be completely washable, but not plastic. She is to have 180 moving parts, all of them replaceable. She is to have a kiss that will heal everything, from a broken leg to a broken heart. She is to have a lap that will disappear whenever she stands up, and she is able to function on black coffee and leftovers. And she's supposed to have six pairs of hands. Six pairs of hands, said the angel. <laughs> well, that's impossible. It's not the six pairs of hands that bothers me, said the Lord. It's the three pairs of eyes. She's supposed to have one pair that sees through closed doors so that whenever she says, what are you doing in there? She already knows what they're doing in there. She has another pair in the back of her head to see all those things she's not supposed to see but must see. And she has one pair right in front that can look at a child who goofed and communicate love and understanding without even saying a word. That's too much, said the angel. You can't put that much in one model. Why don't you rest for a while and resume your creating tomorrow? Oh, no, I know I, I can't do that, said the Lord. I'm close to creating someone very much like myself. I've already come up with a model who can heal herself when she is sick, who can feed a family of six with one pound of hamburger, and who can persuade a nine-year-old to take a shower. Then the angel looked at the model of motherhood a little more closely and said, um, I think she's too soft. Oh, nah, she's tough, said the Lord. You'd be surprised at how much this mother can do. Can she think? asked the angel. Not only can she think, said the Lord, but she can reason and compromise and persuade. Then the angel reached over and, and, and touched her cheek and says, This one has a leak. 
he said. I told you that you couldn't put that much stuff into one model. That's not a leak, said the Lord. That's a tear. A tear? What's a tear for? asked the angel. Well, it's for joy, sadness, for sorrow, for disappointment and pride. <laughs> you're, you're a genius, said the angel. But the Lord said, oh, but I didn't put the tear there. That's a beautiful story about how important mothers are. And you are incredible ladies. And we want to honor you at Crosspoint. And as I was thinking about what I was going to do for Mother's Day, it's always, I will tell you, one of the toughest sermons for me. Uh, it just seems like there's so much expectations. And I just don't know if I've got the capability to even begin to honor all the motherhood that's out in the congregation or will be listening to this message online. But as I thought about it, since we've got so many unique mothers at Crosspoint, I thought, what if I did a message dealing with three very unique, excuse me, I'm an English major, there's no such thing as very unique, three unique mothers in the Bible. That's right, three mothers that singularly possess something and show us something that no other mothers do. And so I came up with three, and that's always good since most sermons are three points of poem and a prayer. So my three mothers for this Sunday are Eve, Sarah, and Mary. Each one of them show a different composite of motherhood. Eve, for instance, gives us purpose and demonstrates purpose with her life. Sarah is a pattern, if you will, or a model to follow. And then finally, Mary is a lady that lives her life on promise. Now, let me, let me kind of walk you through those three very quickly, very briefly, because each one has an important role, an important part, an important, important message to all you ladies. For instance, Eve, and you can read about her if you want to go back, and I encourage you to, and you, you dads as well, you can read about her, for the most part, in Genesis 1 through 4. One of the things that you're going to find is that God created Eve to be Adam's Yetzer. Now, that word Yetzer is Hebrew, and it means uh, one who comes alongside, who assists. In so many ways, I see uh, mothers as being kind of the Holy Spirit in their family that comes alongside and assists. But sometimes that word helper is translated in a demeaning, derogatory, uh, servitude way, and it's not that. In fact, David, only David calls God, David more than anybody else calls God his helper. So it's a high, dignified term. So instead of thinking it like as a plumber's helper, we think of it as a divine helper. David viewed God as his Yetzer, one that came alongside, enabled him, and completed him to do what he needed to do. Now with Eve, we see something interesting. We see that he, it, she is the helper in that family because number one, she's a, and we'll, we'll talk about this in depth on Sunday, she's a co-worker. Um, it says that Adam was to cultivate and keep the garden. But then it says in Genesis 2, uh, 15, that there was no helper suitable for him. So Eve was uh, commanded or created, if you will, to come alongside. In other, she is a co-equal partner in this business of tending the garden and everything else that families would do. Secondly, there was no one suitable that could um, match up with Adam, so she was also a companion, Genesis 2.18. And finally, uh, Adam named all the animals and he looked at them and all the other animals had compatible, or if you will, uh, companions that would go with them. So thirdly, Eve was created to be compatible with Adam, someone that Adam could relate to. You see, it was not good for man to be alone. 
and he needed someone that was going to be a co-worker with him, someone that was going to be a companion, and someone that was going to be compatible, especially if he was going to continue on the human race. And of course, that's why Eve is so important. She was the first mother. I think it's kind of interesting as I've thought about this passage, it's kind of dawned on me that oftentimes we just read things into passages and we don't think about it. Remember when God says to her in Genesis, the third chapter, verse 15, I believe it is, that you shall have pain, or maybe 16, you shall have pain in childbirth. Well, there'd been no childbirth up to this time. I'm guessing Eve said, uh, what's childbirth? And then when God begins to explain what childbirth is, she might be saying, um, you created me for that? For that purpose as well? And he says, you're uniquely qualified. So there's an amazing purpose that we see in the life of Eve. We also see that even in the midst of great pain, Eve accomplished her purpose. You recall Cain was born, then Abel, and then then Cain kills Abel, and then Cain departs. So there's no children. She has another son, a son called Seth. And you can read about that in Genesis, the fourth chapter, that continues that. So Eve shows us that you can still accomplish your purpose in life, even in the midst of great pain. The second lady that we're going to look at is Sarah, and Sarah is mentioned more than any other woman in the Bible. She is exonerated in 1 Peter, the third chapter. We see Sarah at her best and her worst as we read about her, and you can read about her, and I hope you do, and you can begin reading about her in Genesis, the 11th chapter, verse 29, where she and Abram, say Sarah and Abraham, are married at that point. That is Genesis eleven twenty nine, and you can read about her death and burial with Abraham in Genesis 25 through 10. So that span of scripture spends time talking about Sarah and Abraham and her being a mother as well. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting is that when Peter is going to pull out a model for mothers and wives, he pulls out Sarah. And one of the things that he says, and you can read this in 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 6, he commends her, he exalts her, he praises her, because she had, among other things, and I believe that if you read the story of Sarah, you're going to see that, um, how can I put this? Um, I'm thinking of a Lionel Richie song, Like a Brick House. Um, because she was like in her 80s and 90s, and men were still finding her attractive. So, but in spite of that beautiful outwardness, it says that also she had this inner beauty. In fact, it calls it a gentle and quiet spirit. And you see, one of the things that she so used with Abraham, because you had to have a gentle and quiet spirit with Abraham, I mean, twice, not once, but twice, he tried to pawn her off to another king in order that he wouldn't be killed. I mean, this is not exactly the paragon of piety. But yet, she trusts God. She maintains this gentle and quiet spirit. You see, Sarah shows us in the midst of great fear, you can still stay faithful. In fact, that's how you have to face fears with faithfulness and trust in God. And what a great attribute, what two great attributes for mothers to have today, a gentle and quiet spirit. Gentle means, um, in scripture, it's this idea of a power under control. It didn't mean that she was a, a pushover. It meant that she had power, but it was under control. Tranquil means that there was this inner peace within her heart. I tell you what, ladies, I can't imagine having to teach toddlers, five year olds, six year olds, eight year olds, 10 year olds, school at home in homeschooling. If you don't need a gentle and quiet spirit, I don't know who does. 
But you see, that's one of the ways that you can emulate Sarah is with that gentle and quiet spirit. The third person that we're going to talk about is one of the great ladies, and that's Mary. You see, Mary shows us the life of promise, whereas Eve showed us that there's purpose for all mothers and women and wives. Sarah shows us that there is, um, there, there's a pattern to follow in her life. She shows us this pattern of not succumbing to fear, but staying faithful. Mary shows us that it's possible to live a life of great deprivation and yet count on the promises of God. You see, Mary was a slave, not a slave girl, but she was a very, very, very poor in a backwater town. And yet God came to her because in the spite of her having very little that the world had to offer, she had this great God that had promised a Messiah. Now you can read about Mary, and I hope you do, in Luke, the first and second chapters, and in Matthew, the first chapter. One of the things I want you to pay particular attention to is the time that Mary meets Gabriel. Now, this is not the first time a woman has met, if you will, a, um, a, an angel. It happened a first time with Hagar, and you'll read about that in the story of Sarah. But if you read about Mary, you'll see that God made five incredible promises to her about her son. Talk about a pre-birth announcement. She gets this visit by an angel, and then the angel tells us she, she's found favor in, his, in God's eyes. And then he gives five promises, and read those and mark them out in your Bible. Underline, draw one with a circle. Underline, draw two with a circle. Five promises. But all those promises date all the way back to the first promise in the Bible, Genesis 3 where he says, your seed shall triumph over Hanakash, or the serpent's seed. And Mary lived a life of promise. All of her hopes, all of her dreams were in Jesus, but she was at the cross, and she was watching her great, wonderful, blessed, beautiful boy die a horrible death for not only her sins. Yes, she did have sins. There was no immaculate conception for Mary. She had sins like you and I, and that's what makes her so incredible. She was a normal, everyday woman with all the foibles that go with that, with all the foibles that go with child rearing. But you see, she never let go of the promise that her boy was the boy born to be king. We find her in Acts, the first chapter, in the upper room, when that great Holy Spirit moment came, the one promised by her son. Three incredible women that we'll look at this Sunday, Eve, Sarah, and Mary that show us so much about not only just being a woman, but show us so much about being a mother. Now, let me say as a sidebar to all you dads and moms, if they're not watching this, be sure you show this to them and get the kids in there. Listen, I've got an assignment for all you dads. I need your help. Pastor needs your help. I can't do it. We were going to honor all our moms. We do it every time with, with a special little breakfast thing for moms. We can't do that Sunday because we're not meeting here in the church building. So I need your help. Will you, as, as husbands and as sons and daughters, will you get up, fix mama breakfast in bed. I mean, don't cook it there. Cook it in the kitchen and bring it in there. And treat her royally because she's your mama. And then you all gather together and watch what God has to say about these incredible women that God's given to you. Thanks for joining me in the study this week. I'll see you next week as we, we continue on our study 
I hope each and every one of you are doing well. Pastor Michael and I pray for you all every day. We hope you're staying healthy and holy as well. And keep praying. We're looking forward to getting back together, hopefully sooner rather than later. We love you, we bless you, and we can't wait to see you in person. Thanks for joining us and being here with me today in the study. I'm Dr. Dix Winston, Senior Pastor of Cross Point Community Church.